I just jumped at the chance because I was like, I've I've got my foot in the door now. This is this is where I wanted to be. And watching all the kids line up at the end, get random assorted things signed and get yeah. photos and the parents are just so proud that their their young kids are, are meeting their heroes. It's just it's really heartwarming. The Usain Bolt experience was was definitely an experience. And those kind of moments were, you know, just they're so lovely to see and it just it makes the job so rewarding. It's amazing. Welcome to Not The Rob Bell Podcast, where we talk with business owners, marketers and professionals to extract what makes people and businesses successful. Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in to Not The Rob Bell Podcast. Today's guest, I've got Carly Carmichael from Central Coast Mariners Football Club. We talk all things marketing regional sporting teams, the Usain Bolt experience, and so much more. It's coming up now. All right, so Carly Carmichael from Central Coast Mariners. Thank you so much for coming today and having a chat. No, thank you so much for having me. It's really good to have you here. And obviously there's a little bit of uh, challenge going on in the, the football leagues at the moment uh, with COVID and, and uh, everything that's going on. We don't want to cover that too much today. We'll probably get into it a little bit, uh, but really... Uh, I want to learn a bit about yourself first. Um, obviously, you're marketing and communications manager over there. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to work for the Mariners? And Because I think there's an interesting story there. Yeah, so um, I didn't really get into the position by the traditional, you know, go to uni for a few years and then and then, you know, apply for, for jobs. I was actually working uh, at the local radio station in sponsorship and promotions. Um, I'd been there for probably about four years. Um, really loved the people there. It was a great environment. But radio is one of those industries I feel that you really have to be passionate about to continue in. And I kind of felt bad that there's all these people that were so desperate to get into the industry that I felt like, you know, these probably – these people probably deserved the role <laughs> more than I did. Sure. So um, I actually knew the commercial manager at the Mariners because obviously I was working on the sponsorship with the Mariners from the radio station side. Um, spoke to him about it and he said, look, unfortunately we don't have any positions going, but if you want some experience, you're welcome to come in and, and volunteer. So I quit my job at the radio. I uh, moved back home with my parents to save some money. Bold um, move. Yes. Really good when you're 20 something. It was a big change. Sure. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, so I worked in a bar at night and worked at the Mariners during the day just to get that experience. Thankfully, after a little while, they um, offered me a paid position and then worked my way out from there. Wow. And so that relationship that you founded through uh, the sponsorship division mm. at, at uh, the radio station, do you think that kind of gave you an edge to, uh, you know, to get in? Because it would have been fairly early stage for Mariners back then again. Uh, like, do you... When, yeah. when did Mariners first kick off to the coast and, you know, how's that evolved <laughs> since that point? Yeah, so the Mariners had been around for probably about five or six years before I um, started working there. Yep. Um, I, before that, I was one of those crazy fans that would <laughs> take my weekly income and use it travelling around Australia, watching them play around, sure. which was really fantastic. So it's kind of good that I've had that um, that angle of the fan as well as someone who's an employee. Um, yeah, it was when I look back on it, I feel like it's very bold of me to just try and make that jump. But I mean, I've always been passionate about sport and um, especially in playing in sport, I understand sort of what that real community feel is to be involved in something that's just, it makes you feel like you're part of the family. And I just really wanted to be a part of that. It's, it's really cool. And I think you have to have that passion to do anything, especially to take a leap of faith mm. uh, and, and basically quit your job and, and take a total punt. <laughs> Uh, and so how did that evolution come about? When was that uh, that point where you'd gone from basically volunteering and that little that first little opportunity came out of that and you knew that that was sort of the right decision? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, they just offered me some casual work and I just jumped at the chance because I was like, I've, I've got my foot in the door now. This is, this is where I wanted to be. So I made sure that, you know, there were some nights we were back there working until 2 a.m., packing jerseys and, and things like that to send off for uh, merchandise and, and all of that. So putting in those really hard hours, you sort of, it, it felt like it was my reward that I finally got what I deserved. Um, and then, yeah, then from then on, I got offered a full-time position and I'd worked in a couple of different areas around the club, doing a little bit of corporate hospitality, a little bit of membership uh, and then fan engagement marketing, which is where I really started off. 
So moving from there, sort of done a few different departments, got a lot of experience, which really does help me in that marketing role because I kind of understand now what each department really needs and and how I can make sure that we can market them because they're all very, very different sure, needs. Sure, yeah. Mm. Uh, and obviously there's uh, quite a lot to be said for that first-hand experience mm. in seeing what the fans need or being a fan yourself, seeing what the corporate hospitality clients expect and because there aren't a lot of moving parts. Mm. but And I think when we when we think around sporting teams and the corporate side of that, uh, as in the, t- the the corporate side working for those mm. teams, we probably have a perception of a really huge workforce. But it sounds like the reality is probably a little bit different. <laughs> yes. So it's it's bigger now than when I started working there. We only sure. had um, you know a handful of staff. But now looking at it in the office, we would probably have about ten to eleven people. Okay. Um, and that's across um, our community department, marketing, media, commercial. We've also got a foundation as well where we um, raise money to help young footballers progress their career. So everyone sort of, and then also membership as well, sorry. So in that the you know, that key, key admin staff full time is probably only yeah, about 10 or 11. So when you compare that to a lot of the other A-League clubs, we are um, quite small. <laughs> and so I think obviously <coughs> there's... Um, we know that, that Mariners mm. is a little bit smaller than some of the other um, A-League clubs. But then how does that factor in, say, scale against, you know, mainstream football, uh, you know, like or rugby or, uh, you know, Aussie rules? Yeah, well, you know, the comparisons is, you know, NRL and, and um, AFL have got some huge, huge staff numbers. Um, I had a friend that worked in AFL and she told me the number of membership staff they had working and uh, you compare that to our one that we have obviously our membership numbers are a lot smaller but at their stage you know they weren't it was only a relatively new AFL club so the numbers weren't massive um not like Sydney Swans where they're at 40,000 plus but you still go you go oh god eight or nine people working in in uh in an AFL membership you compare that to our one who you know while he does membership is still also doing um, a lot of our you know, administration work, bringing on our volunteers and training them up. And, you know, everyone at the club has more than one role. It's, you sort of, you have to do what comes, um, comes to you. I guess right now, coronavirus is the best example I can give. So unfortunately we're down to skeleton staff. We had to, um, stand down quite a lot of staff. Um, there's probably only about four or five of us still working at the moment. So, um, between myself and our media manager, we've also taken on a little bit of graphic design. We've also had to take on all the you know, the other administration work coming through, just the general phone emails calls. that are coming yep. through, phone calls, even down to sort of like doing cleaning around the office yeah, and, of and all of that. Our commercial guy, he's also now doing membership. He's also now delivering, you know, little goodie packs to some of our older members who just, you know, need a little bit more assistance during this time. Yep. So it's everyone is having to do, you know, two or three different roles, but everyone's just getting stuck in and, and getting it done because that's that's the way that we've always worked. And I kind of feel like the Mariners are probably – the best club prepared for coronavirus because we are used to working with limited resources sure. and we're used to just getting stuck in and getting it done. And making that dollar go further. Yeah, exactly. You can out of it. So how, um, how do you find that you need to sort of challenge perception, say when you take on a sponsor or you, uh, someone approaches you, uh, you for support, you know, what, what aspects of their perception of, the Mariners as a club, do you think are misconceived when they think that it's this massive commercial giant like some of the bigger clubs? Yeah, I mean, we are a small club compared to the others in the A-League, but that also gives us so many more benefits than others. Um, We work really closely with the 23 or now 24 local clubs on the Central Coast, whereas you look at someone like Sydney FC or Western Sydney Wanderers, they have so many local clubs that fall under their districts that they need to maintain a relationship and make sure that they have that, you know, that one-on-one feel with them. Whereas we've got the 24, we actually have an ambassador from every single club who we contact regularly and say, these are our programs. How can we help you? How can we help your club grow? What do you need from us? 
they also come to us and ask for things like player appearances or or jerseys that they can use as fundraising items. So we do have that really good relationship. So that's a huge benefit for us. Um, the, the community feel as well is also a big draw card for us. Um, Master Foods, who's been a sponsor from day one, they're the best example that we could really have because they they um they employ a lot of local people they are central coast they are so passionate about the coast so for them that really you know warm close feeling that they have with the mariners is exactly what what works so well and what we were able to sort of take this partnership to now we are best known for our sauce bottles next to the palm trees and the sauce sure. bottle blimp and the tomato sauce mascot that you see on match day. We've sort of <laughs> been able to, you know, take this this local partnership and really blow it up to something that's um, that's spoken about across the league. And, and I suppose that represents uh, the importance of those long-term sponsorships. Mm. Um and while there's certainly factors outside of that that we can't control, such as COVID, which is going on right now, how do you go about managing those partnerships and trying to strike the balance between uh, providing value for them back, but also getting that support that you need? Yeah, well, I guess at the moment, um, in a lot of our partners' contracts, we've got things that happen on game day. Right now, we can't deliver those. So that's actually how we came up with Mariners TV, which is a, a live program we've been running on Facebook every fortnight. Yep. Um, we've spoken about Mariners TV for as long as I can remember at the club. We've <laughs> always wanted to do it. It's sort of been a, a little dream of ours that, you know, we would be able to have these nice behind the scenes things with our players and, and really be able to commercialise it. We've never had the resources or the time or, or anything like that. Now we had to go, well, we still don't have the resources. We still, we got, we got more time. So let's just get it done. So we've had to sort of, yeah, we, at, we first, our first episode, we actually opened with, this is actually for our sponsors. We are doing it to thank them because during this time, they're still sticking by us and they're still supporting us. So we need to do this to thank our sponsors. And we actually got a really good reception and our members and fans understood that because yep. without the sponsors, the club wouldn't survive. So, um, yeah, and then so from then on, obviously the next few episodes, we've managed to, you know, bring them in. Uh, one of our sponsors, Mate, gave us some Xboxes to give away. Fruit for All, who is actually one of our local sponsors. They've been with us since day one. They sponsored because they were fans. They're massive football fans. Awesome. They And that passion is what's kept them as part of our, our Mariners family. So, you know, they donated fruit that we've been delivering to people and, and putting onto that Mariners TV as well. So, yeah, we've had to do things differently. Um, but, yeah, the sponsors have been fantastic during this time and, and you know, we couldn't do it without them. So, Were you uh, – was there anything surprising around engagement when you first put out those first few episodes? You know, was it was – it uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you're <laughs> laughing, so there must have been something interesting that happened. I um, <laughs> I didn't really um, think that I would be on Mariners TV. <laughs> As I mentioned to you before, I um, am very much a background person. I sort of prefer to sort of That's stay out of yeah. – Well, yeah, this is a whole other thing. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I do much prefer to sort of stay in the background. And You can even ask our old media manager if he took any photos and I was in them. They had to be deleted. <laughs> um, yeah, so I – I was like, oh, I don't know. I just like I hope some I hope some people watch it for the sake of our our sponsors and and the and what we're trying to do. But I was like, I just don't know if if people are going to be interested in it. But we're watching the numbers grow and grow each week, and you know, it's it's really it's really warming to see we're such getting such a good response. And and Mariners uh, members and fans are actually finding us on on Facebook and sending us messages and and saying, oh. Thank you. That was actually a really good show. It was really good that you spoke about this. So to get that kind of feedback is we know that we're doing the right thing and we want to keep making sure that we're providing good content for them. And obviously we're, we're focused on the sponsors a little bit at the moment, mm. but uh, obviously the fans who are holding season passes and that sort of thing, there's a bit of a delicate challenge there mm. as well. Is that process helping cater for them seeing value, even though they don't have to pay to get the content? Uh, is that just still helping deliver value for those members in what you're putting out? Yes. So I can't really go into this this part too much. Sure. Um, we understand the frustrations of our members. 
we understand that we want to go to games. We, we want to be working at games. We want to be there and, and be part of the action just as much as they do. So, so making sure they do feel valued at this time is important. It is tricky because right now we, we don't have that much information. We, you know, whatever information we get, we do pass on as soon as we can. Sure. But there's a, there's a lot of information that we can't pass on until things are 100% signed off. So of I can completely understand when our members and and fans get frustrated that, you know, they see things pop up in the media that, you know, they're hearing. But if it's not 100% true, then we we can't comment on it and we can't announce it. So it's that is that part is frustrating. But then again, as a fan, I can understand. Even the other day waking up and seeing on Twitter that, apparently the club's moving to Manly, <laughs> you sort of go, oh, good, yeah, this new cycle again, awesome. So yeah. I can I can completely understand where they're coming from. So during this time it is really hard, but we are trying to make sure that we engage them continually. And so it brings us to an interesting, uh, interesting sort of side thought around uh, the PR and the hype aspect that can, can happen here. And I want to touch briefly on Usain Bolt <laughs> coming to the club. And when we first heard about this happening, I think there was probably more people that thought it was another internet rumour than that it was something legitimate. And regardless of the legitimacy, how important are those eyeballs and and that interest, even just just raising awareness of the A-League, which is still relatively small Mm -hmm. in Australian sport? The Usain Bolt experience was was definitely an experience. (laughs) Um, We'd actually joked about it a few months earlier before it all happened because I think at the stage he was talking about wanting to have a football career and we're like, oh, yeah, we should bring him to the Mariners and that was sort of it. It was a couple of jokes thrown around and then I remember being brought into the boardroom and told, nope, he's coming to the Mariners. (laughs) And I think it probably took me about 48 hours to actually go, okay, this is – this is actually happening. Sure. Um, and I'm full credit to all the staff there who like just went into overdrive mode. You know, we had games and, and that to organise and with all of that comes additional security and, and all this media suddenly wanted to be involved in, in the Mariners and yeah. we were getting requests from, you know, countries like you know, UK and and random countries in South America and, yeah, it was just – it was phenomenal and – you, it's still, still to this day, it doesn't still, still seem real. Sure. <laughs> um, and you couldn't even turn on the TV without seeing either Usain Bolt or our CEO, Sean Mellicamp. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was incredibly important to us because we actually had all these people actually taking an interest in us and talking about the A-League, which, you know, doesn't, doesn't get spoken about much overseas. So, and, and while it was only a short, short-term um, journey for him, you know, it was incredibly important to us, especially leading up to our season. Um, during that time, we were leading into the FFA Cup, I think, and then going into our pre-season. So normally during that time, all talk is on NRL because it's NRL finals or AFL finals even, and A-League just doesn't normally get a mention. Sure, yeah. So it was, it was, you know, we had millions of dollars worth of media value that we essentially, you know, would never have gotten – Never, or never been able to get. So, yeah, it was it was fantastic. And, you know, we had games where we were actually able to, because they weren't um, official games, we were able to try some things. Like, you know, we had music playing during a game, which never happens. Yep. Um, you know, we were able to sort of push the limits a little bit and see what happens and actually make – a regular game day into more of an entertainment experience. Sure. So that was that was really huge for us as well. And so were there takeaways from that process? Uh, so obviously, you know, um, as probably everyone's aware, Usain Bolt didn't uh, sign with the club, and 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 that was you know that's the way these things go. But the the PR impact of that probably had a, a very lasting effect on the club, say for an entire season. You know, is there some kind of way you can try and replicate that? You know, maybe not exactly in its in its entirety, mm. but are you are you hunting for that kind of approach again in order to get that PR value? Um, it, it's a very tricky thing because, and I guess I'm not a I'm not from the um, coaching side of it, but you do need to make sure that you respect that that line of professional footballers and where it may get taken too far. Sure. So. 
while it was it was a great experience, I think, um, yeah, and it, we, we need to make sure that um, it it is a benefit to our footballing footballing side of uh, yeah. of the club. So, but definitely in in terms of um, uh, managing media and and being able to push those boundaries a little bit and how we and how we ch- uh, take on those challenges, yeah, definitely been able to take that away. Did that help you forge some relationships with, say, media outlets? So when there is something uh, happening now, or maybe not right now, but mm. uh, when things return to normal, you know, can you extend the reach of the Mariners League or the Mariners Club? you know, into some of those outlets just from those initial contacts when all that hype was going on? Yeah. So we had, um, you know, like I said, people from all over the world contacting us. Unfortunately, our season results haven't been fantastic in the last couple of seasons. And so interest has dropped off. But every time we, you know, we try to do things within the community, we are able to reach out. And and we've got some longstanding um, uh media personalities that always support us, which has been fantastic. Even example of um, on Mariners TV the other day where she spoke to Adam Peacock, who's a Fox Sports uh, presenter. Great. He's actually putting together a podcast about the Usain Bolt experience. Okay. So he was able to chat to a couple of our staff members who were heavily involved and, um, and yeah, really show that side of that side of the process. That's interesting. And and so I know that you're involved with some community clubs Mm -hmm. as well, and we'll probably come back to Mariners again, but uh, what are some of the experiences that you've had uh, working with the Mariners that you can take home to, you know, your volunteer work with the smaller clubs or that you can sort of help people who are trying to get sponsorship, uh, even if it's just for jerseys and that sort Mm -hmm. of thing, you know, is there something you can take away there to help the smaller clubs who, you know, maybe in a different league it's, and it's indirect from the Mariners? Um, with So with the clubs on the coast, there's a huge difference between them. You've got some of the clubs like Terrigal and East Gosford who've got, you know, over a thousand participants, which is just massive. And then you've got some smaller clubs who, you know, might only have a handful of teams in total. So it's actually, it, it has opened my eyes to that you've got to actually make sure that you understand each club's each club's um, position. So you may, you know, offer a, offer a particular donation to one club, which may be fantastic for them, but it may not be suitable to the needs of a different club. So we've got um, a community, uh, community department. They work really closely with the local clubs to make sure that we're able to understand what they need and what would actually benefit them. We've had a program running um, over the last couple of years called the My Club Program. So any junior um, registered player can get a Mariners membership for $15. In the past, there was also always a $5 donation that went back to the clubs. So it was sort of an incentive for the clubs to promote it because at the end of the season, they then got a cash donation. So it was a way of saying, this is how we're going to help you. And then from then on, we're trying to really – Re- reinvent that program again to make sure that we're we're hitting the needs of um of each individual club. So it's a bit of a um it's a work in progress at the moment. So it was something that they were working on before, unfortunately, coronavirus uh, hit yeah, the uh, the redevelopment of it. But yeah, it's something that you know we're very passionate about to making sure. And and I I've, I've played for a local club for the last 10, 12 years, and you know I understand what you know, what goes on in a local club and, and and how their mariners are actually so important to them because we've had club nights where we would have 100 local kids and then all the mariners players go out and, and coach a, a group of 10 of them and watching all the kids line up at the end get random assorted things signed and get yeah. photos and the parents are just so proud that their, their young kids are, are meeting their heroes. It's just, it's really heartwarming. And how important is that uh, sort of role model role for players? And, and we don't see it so much in A-League, but uh, some sporting codes have a real perception problem sometimes. Uh, but how important is that role model where these kids can actually meet mm-hmm. a Mariners player, be coached by a Mariners player? And, and that goes obviously for you know each geographic area and mm-hmm. their respective clubs. But uh, how important is that value in terms of creating – fans for the Mariners and, and sort of completing that cycle? Oh, it's, it's, it's especially on the Central Coast because 
you could go anywhere in Sydney and probably not see a Sydney FC player, but you could go to Erin Affair and you could probably run into Matt Simon <laughs> doing his grocery shopping yep. because the Central Coast is that small. So to for these kids to know that they've got these local heroes among them is so important and we need to make sure that, you know, they have these really fantastic experiences. So at the end of every game, the players do their walk around and they shake hands and they take photos with the fans and that's, that's that sort of that first touch that, you know, they might get, they might come to a game for the first time, you know, get to high five Matt Simon. And, and for them, that's what they take away. They yeah. might not, they might not remember the score or what happened, sure. but it's actually that connection that they have. And then doing certain things, um, really sort of finding those stories. We actually had a, a um, young boy, he was chosen to walk out with the team and he walked, he walked out with Tommy Orr and was just his, his mum showed me photos and the kid is just like starstruck. He's just, he was so happy and apparently was talking about it for, for weeks. We found out that um, he had quite a significant injury where he'd broken um, part of his leg and wasn't able to go back to football. Sure. And for him, that was really discouraging because, you know, he'd had sort of um, a couple of setbacks and all he wanted to do was play football with his friends again. We managed to um, get Tommy Orr to surprise him at his house with a jersey and sit down and have a chat. Tommy Orr obviously had some injuries in the past as well. So he was able to have a chat with that young boy and explain, oh, look, I had, I've had i been in a similar position and, you know, you just got to keep training and, and make sure you're strong because then you can play football for longer. And those kind of moments were, you know, just they're so lovely to see and it just it makes the job so rewarding. And, and just knowing that, you know, and when, when we were there, the little boy was quite, he was very quiet. I think he was a bit shocked. Like, why is this, yeah. why is, uh, why is Tommy Orr in my lounge room? But apparently for weeks after he kept talking about it, was talking about how his friend Tommy came to visit him. And, and that is just, you know, it's so important to know that our, our players are passionate about their fans and, and want to make sure they're doing the right things for them. And obviously with this sort of community feedback loop, the other um, aspect that can come from this is, uh, say supporting not-for-profits or causes mm -hmm. in particular as well. And a sporting club like the Mariners has a unique ability to turn, say, a piece of apparel such as a jersey into a very high-ticket item mm -hmm. by getting the right signatures on it. And, uh, and you know, even if they uh, – even if you go sell it or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, auction it as a, uh, you know, as a high-priced item to, to gain some funding for something or gain support for something – how important is that role and can it be over leveraged at times? We, we try not to do too many because I think you're right. The more, the more you put them out there, the less value they have. And again, that's, that's kind of a, a downfall to being such a small community is that you can get a signature, you know, at a game or, you know, if you see Matt Simon at Coles, that sure, sort of yeah. thing. So you do need to make sure that we're not, um, you know, giving them out. To, to every single person that asks because it does decrease that value. Yeah. While I wish we could do that because we love to support all different kinds of, of um, charities and, and community groups. It's just it's just not possible for us. We do actually, um, we aligned ourselves with five community partners just to sort of uh, be able to make sure that we were concentrating our efforts into it's more like quality over quantity. Sure. And so one of those is actually Cancer Council New South Wales, in particular the Central Coast branch. Yep. We've been working with them for probably about eight years now on our pink round. And that's probably the best example of how we work with community partners. Um, so every year we do a round that's dedicated to women's cancer research. And we have a one-off pink jersey that um, all of our players wear and then at the end they get signed and we auction them off and all money raised goes to Cancer Council New South Wales. Awesome. And that's sort of become, you know, a staple within our fixture each year. It used to be held in October because that's when Cancer Council like to align it. Now we sort of hold it, um, you know, when we feel like we will get the the most, um, yeah, the, sort of the biggest – the most value. Yeah, yeah, the most value, sorry. Um, so this year we actually held it in line with um, International Women's Day. Great. Which was was a nice little tie-in yep. and, um, yeah, it was really good. And, and as an added touch, one of our um, academy coaches, his wife unfortunately is quite unwell um, with melanoma. Um, so we did some additional fundraising particularly for their families. Yep. And, and that was sort of a – it was – 
we sort of had this uh, story that we could tell that was actually so close to home. And I think a lot of people realised, well, oh, this is this is why we're doing it. It's not just money for a charity. We actually can sort of see where the money is going and and that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's important to strike that balance. And obviously mm. we all want to support as much as we can, but uh, especially a team with limited resources and mm. – uh, and that, it has to be measured. And on that, back on the business side of it a little bit, uh, obviously in January, uh, there's obviously the uh, the New Year's Mariners game, mm-hmm. home game every year. And uh, and I've had the privilege of watching the fireworks at the end and all that sort of thing. Obviously this year there was a curveball with fireworks and and that spectacle yes. due to the bushfires. And, and there was a lot of contr- controversy on both sides of that argument. Does that kind of have a have a direct impact on what you guys are doing uh, in terms of planning, or are people just coming for the game regardless? And uh, you know, the rest is bonus. Uh, we definitely have to take it into consideration, especially um, we were doing some uh, fundraising for the rural fire service from November, so we had made sure we had aligned ourselves with um, the local unit here on the central coast, sure. and we're raising money to make sure that we could. Um, give them some equipment upgrades. That raised thirty thousand dollars or so, I yeah, think. Yes. From yeah, yes. Yeah, yep. So that was really fantastic. I actually got a um a message from the guys there recently, their new radios had just come in. Amazing. So that was really it was actually really lovely. It was I think it was about nine thirty at night and I sort of was you After know think, well no, it was just, <laughs> you know, when, you know, everything happening at the moment, you like everyone lives are a bit changed, feeling a little bit down. Yep. So to see that was yeah, it was actually really, really lovely. And I think I really needed to, to hear that good news. So yeah. yeah, so obviously we've been doing some um, fundraising for RFS. So we understood, uh, we could we could understand both sides that, you know, of where we needed to come, where you needed to sit in the fireworks uh, debate. Yeah. But for us, we, we've got a really good relationship with Central Coast Council. So we obviously respect we respected their decision. And um, I mean, unfortunately on the night, the weather was wasn't great. Um, so yeah, a lot of their um, activations that they had had to close up a little bit earlier. So it was d- disappointing because it was completely out of their control. And I know the staff had put so much effort into to making this event yeah. and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make it a big event without the fireworks having to be the the main um, in, in the main finale. event. Yep. Yes. So yeah, you just have to work with what you've got. And that's, I guess, again, that's what the Mariners do. Just roll with the punches. Yeah. I c- uh, a bit of an example, a few years ago, we had a game which was it's like a seven o'clock on a Sunday or something. It was ridiculous. Strange times. It wasn't family friendly. Yeah. And as being a club who attracts a lot of families, we were like, well, this isn't this isn't good for our members and fans. It's not suitable. Sure. So I think with a couple of days out, the game got changed to, I think it was like two or three o'clock. So much more family friendly time. So then it was like, okay, how do we make this a family event? And we in a few within a few days, we had a mums and bubs lounge. We had a kids crèche. <laughs> we had free beers for the dad. Like oh. it was all this stuff that we managed to turn around in a couple of days. Yep. And you kind of sit back afterwards and you go, "Oh God, how do we get that done?" But it's just the the Mariners' way. You just you just get it done. <laughs> and, and I think there's something to be said for that underdog mentality, mm. or you know, um, bootstrapped kind of mentality, yep. which I, I think a lot of people would assume doesn't exist in mm. any kind of club. And so speaking of uh, like thinking on your feet, we've seen some videos with uh, Marvin the mascot doing some <laughs> funny skits around the office and, and pushing over trolleys full of toilet yep. paper and that sort of thing. Was that, a again, just a, an engagement aspect of uh, trying to keep that communication going or was it really just whoever's wearing that mascot uniform just having a crack? I love Marvin so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Marvin was obviously the mascot when I was a fan. Um, and then around the time we won the championship around 2012, 2013, some new mascots were introduced and, and Marvin was, um, retired to greener pastures. Um, and then, yeah, in the last six months or so, we, um, we found the costume. It was uh, unearthed and, you know, lots of people sharing their good memories of Marvin (laughs) on game day and how he was a little bit crazy and a little bit wild and, um, our CEO mentioned the Panda Cheese commercials, which I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with, Vaguely. but it's essentially an angry panda that doesn't like the fact that you're not having cheese yep. and uh, has a bit of destruction, which 
we kind of went, oh, it's, it's got some Marvin vibes to it. So we, as a joke, we recreated one of the, um, one of the commercials and it actually was, it was well accepted. We were like, oh, we, we weren't sure that people might've thought, well, mascots are for kids. Mascots need to be friendly and, and, you know, real family friendly. So to sort of have a mascot that was a little bit a little bit angry, had a little bit of attitude. We weren't quite sure how people would take. Well, he did get sidelined for a bunch of years. Yeah, so, yeah. so he had a bit of pent-up frustration, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then from then on we just, you know, we recreated a couple more of those commercials and then started to do things on our own. Marvin now has his own TikTok account. Um, right. So dancing in that costume looks like it's a challenge. <laughs> I don't think it was, it was not made for it. Um, and then, yeah, we got challenged by – a Korean football mascot recently that he was gearing up for a fight with Marvin. So nice. Marvin hit the gym and and all of that. So you've been able to have a bit of fun with him during this time and, and yeah, it's keeping people engaged and just providing a bit of comic relief, I think. And I think that's important right now. And mm. as as time's progressing, we're all sort of focused on, on the way back out. Mm. And uh, do you think that engagement is going to help uh, sort of spring back the, the restoration once games – uh, start back up again? Yeah, I think so because we've been able to really just sort of keep people engaged without having to use footballing content. Um, even the fact that, you know, we've been using, you know, Marvin colouring in competitions to, for some of our younger members yep. and, and things like that. Um, and then obviously once football starts, we're able to bring him into that messaging for game day as well. Um, he, We actually had Marvin at an FFA Cup game where he randomly resurged and had a bit of like a like – all the kids on the field had to chase him and it was all a bit – all a little bit crazy. So, um, yeah, once once games kick off again, definitely would love to see him being more involved. And, and um, he was the only spectator at our um, Melbourne City game where it was <laughs> closed to the general public and he somehow managed to get himself in there with a little – sign that he was waving around nice. so yeah he's definitely uh important we'll continue on and because you guys have been running replays of of uh finals and mm -hmm. and other games you know what's what's the audience audience engagement level of that is it uh, like pleasantly surprising or, or are you just trying to keep the wheels turning at, at whatever pace they can yeah i mean to have those moments that you can relive who doesn't want to watch relive the uh the grand final where we beat the wanderers 2-0 sure, yeah. um so when we announced that we had a lot of really good feedback and and the fact that we were able to as we streaming it as you're streaming it live our social media accounts are actually reliving it as if they're seeing it for the first time so you're actually able to sort of reignite that passion and and that excitement when you know when Danny McBreen scored and then Patrick Zvonsvike, you're sort of, you're going, oh, like this is, it gets you really geared up for football again and you kind of just, you want more. Like even um, I've been watching uh, the Premier League over in Belarus, which is, you know, it's not, not A-League level football, sure. but it's live football. Yeah. And I just sit there and watch it and, you know, I don't understand what the commentators are saying because they're talking in a different <laughs> language. But you just sort of go, oh, you like just it. It makes it's cr making you crave foot live football again, and I really think that's um, driving people up that they just they just want to watch the Mariners again. And so, obviously, on the like, you guys must be doing some kind of planning for the way mm -hmm. out. Are there any particular challenges that you see uh, in trying to get back to sort of pre-COVID attendance um, once games are allowed? Yeah, oh, that's the that's the tricky part at the moment because things are changing so quickly. Um, and you also want to respect um, the the rules and regulations that the government's putting in. And we also don't want to make promises that we can't keep. So, you know, we would hate to say, yeah, sure, no worries, October, we're kicking off again and we'll see you at the stadium because realistically that may not happen. Sure. So we kind of need to be prepared for anything that gets thrown at us, as I've mentioned before. So um, – Right now, we need to focus on finishing the season that we never got to finish. So, which I think is is the big difference between NRL and AFL and where we are. They were only just starting their season, so for them to push it back is a little bit different. For us, we actually have to restart. Well, not restart the season, but we've got to pick off or pick up where we left off, and. And then, you know, all that comes into broadcasters and yeah. venue availability and then keeping in mind how many people have you got around you. You know, if they say you can only have 100 people in the stadium, well, then you need to consider is the 100 people including the players and all the staff in the background and 
and it's it's really really tricky and I mean even even at the moment like I know one of the biggest priorities is actually getting young kids playing football again because for their mental health and and socialization that's you know that's probably more important sure yeah. um keep them running around yeah so there's a lot to a lot to consider um i think of the mariners we've only had four games to to finish up and then so you know how do you get how do you get those games done in a short amount of time which is done in a safe way and keeps the sponsors happy you've got proper broadcasting yep. and it's yeah it's a lot to work out <laughs> and cuz you guys uh, obviously have obviously federal regulations state regulations and then you've got the A-League regulations and then you've mm. got club decisions to be made as well. So mm. there's quite a, a balance there even when things are allowed to move on. Yeah, it's a, a lot to take in. And so, yeah, another reason why we sort of just have to take it day by day because things could change in two weeks' time. Cases could be up again and we could be pushed back. So we just have to, have to sit and wait and, and prepare the best we can for the things we can do. So, you know, going through some of our and seeing what, you know, what things we can catch up on or, you know, let's start working on our marketing plan for next season and, and getting some stuff locked in that, that way. Yeah, mm. interesting. So we're coming up on time, but I've got a few quick questions I wouldn't mind running through. Mm. Uh, if you had a single best tip for a small community club in mm. order to increase their sponsorship levels, what would that be? Personally, I think um, embracing social media. Um, a lot of people, most people are on it these days and it's so much as, you know, a little quick shout out to some of the sponsors that have, you know, donated sausages for your sausage sizzle and things like that. It really does make people feel connected. Um, even um, during this time, there's been a Facebook group, which is Central Coast Delivered to Me. And it's all just local businesses that are putting it out there saying, oh, you know, we're actually delivering our food. And the amount of support people are showing for it is just you know, phenomenal. I never would have thought it would have grown that big. So I think it shows that, you know, social media has such a, um, a big influence, especially on small communities. So I definitely think that. If there was a single biggest lesson that you've learned in 10 years of working for the Mariners around sporting clubs, marketing sporting clubs or sponsorship, what would that be? You've got to think quick on your feet. That's, and I think for me personally, that that suits me the best. I'm one of those people that learns the best if you throw them in the deep end, and and you just got to find the find the way out. That's um, I think that goes in all in all sports because things change so quickly. Things can happen. Thing news can break overnight, and you've got to work out how we're going to deal with this. And that probably leads me to another interesting question: is uh, for anyone watching and listening, how do they determine the difference between the hype and the reality? <laughs> Go straight to the source yeah. or is it just common sense? Yeah. So when things are when things are hundred percent confirmed, the clubs will tell people. Interesting. Good, good tip. So Carly Carmichael, we're uh, pretty much out of time now. Uh, but for anyone who wants to get engaged with the Mariners uh, or watch some really cool TikTok videos of Marvin. Where do they go? Yes, yeah, so we've got our um, we've got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the Central Coast Mariners, which is CC Mariners, and then Marvin is Marvin CCMFC. So you can find him on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. I think we'll just have to check that one out. Yes, <laughs> Carly Carmichael, I've really appreciated this, this chat, and I really hope that Mariners find their way out of COVID uh, in the time coming. Great, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. There you have it. I hope you really enjoyed this episode and if you did, please like it, share it or leave us a review on your favourite platform. It helps us show more of this content to people just like you.